Good morning. Welcome to Digging Deep. Thank you for being here today. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. We're continuing our study in the book of Acts, chapter 13, part 2 today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 13, verse 4, and I believe we'll go down through verse 12. So let's begin with a word of prayer. If you'll repeat this prayer after me, we're just opening our hearts and asking the Lord to speak to us during this time. This prayer is from Psalms 25, verse 4 and 5. It says, show me your ways, teach me your path, guide me in your truth, and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. I love to just pray scripture. Psalm 25, 4 and 5 was that verse. Today is Acts chapter 13, part 2, verses 4 through 12. Let's read the whole passage together and kind of get a uh, recap of where we are in the story. Some of you have been joining us either online or in person every week. And so you know, or maybe you've been reading ahead, but let's just refresh our minds with the story and what's going on here. Verse 4, so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Afterward, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until they finally reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who is an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Eliamus, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, and enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and, heal, and lead him. When the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer. For he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Amen. Bless the, bless the Lord. And the word of God is so powerful. Let's get into it and dig deep with uh, verse 4. The first phrase of verse 4 says, So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Do you remember how this happened? Do you remember how they were sent out by the Holy Spirit? In our last study last week, we talked about it in they were sent out by a prophetic word that was given in a public worship service. So they were all together in the service. Remember, it was Barnabas, and I think the guy's names were Simeon and Lucius and Manian and uh, Saul was there, and they were leading this worship service, and a prophetic word was given, and the Holy Spirit spoke, and it's in quotes. It's, it says to send them out to the work that, to which they have been called. And so we believe that they have been fasting and praying and that they were being prepared to be sent out. And then it was confirmed through a word that was given in that worship service that they were to go out and it was time to do it. And so that was very important that that happened in that service. So now they're being sent out. Verse 4, so Barnum and Sauce were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Remember when we studied this, we also brought up 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, that says a prophetic word is given for strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. If you haven't been with us in the study, look that up. That's what a prophetic word is given for encouragement, strengthening, and comfort. And so this was one of those times when it was given to confirm and encourage. And I believe that it was important that it was done there in the assembly of them together. I think that one of the purposes, oh, oh, let me say this too. I almost skipped over this. This is important. I think this is important while it's important for us to assemble together and be together. And sometimes this is good to assemble even in a small group. 
because then you can share encouragement with one another and you can comfort one another. If they hadn't have been assembled together, uh, I guess the Holy Spirit would have done it another way, but he sure likes to do it when we're assembled together, right? And it says to forsake not the assembly of, uh, uh, assembling together. It's why the community of God was formed, and it's why we don't forsake assembling together. And you may have heard the voice of God speaking to you, and you know that you're supposed to do something, but when you get that confirmation in a service like they got, it was probably important for them to get that kind of confirmation. They were about to go on this journey and set sail and be gone for how, how knows, who knows how long. And I think one of the purposes of the prophetic word being given in the worship service was for the benefit of the church. Uh, Barnabas and Saul had been there teaching in Anak for over a year. And they were teaching large crowds of people. And don't you think they had some followers, right? Some people that were pretty attached to them and their teaching. And they were, they were young and growing in the Lord. And things were happening. And for Barnabas and Saul to leave there and go out, it's good that it was confirmed by that word that was given in the worship service. Because that was just a blessing, a comfort in a sense to the whole church. And I wanted to kind of bring that up from last time. I think that's important that it happened in a uh, worship service. Now, perhaps it wouldn't have been hard for them to let them go because, you know, they were being taught by Paul and Barnabas, right? And maybe you, I'm just projecting our day and time. I think about our day and time, uh, it's hard for us to let somebody go that's on staff or somebody that's been teaching you, right? I've been here, it'll be nine years in February. And since I've been here, we've had four pastors leave this church and go out and start other churches. Not just leave this church, but go and start other churches. Four pastors. And we've had two pastors leave here and go be missionaries. Pastor Scott went to China for five years. And now he's back in the area kind of restarting a church. That would be a fifth pastor that's now pastoring. And then Pastor Priscilla. She just walked through a minute ago. Pastor Priscilla is about to leave next month. Or next month will be her last day here on staff. She's been our care pastor, and she's going to the Dominican Republic as a uh, missionary. So it's a wonderful thing that we have that many pastors and people that are starting churches and things that are happening, but it's always hard. It's hard for me because I work with these people every day, and then I have to let them go and be gone. So I think it was, it was good for them to have this word given in a group like that, you know, in a, in a worship service where everyone could hear that and it would be confirmed and then they are sent out on this missionary journey. I think that was important. I don't want to lay our context onto that story. We want to start with the Word of God, right, and do good <laughs> interpretation of the Word. You know, start with what was said originally and then apply it to us, not apply our situation back onto them. But I would think it would have been helpful for me if I was sitting there and they're about to be gone, that it was that prophetic word was uh, given are y'all tracking with me on that? It's making sense. Okay. Let's keep going in verse 4. That first verse there, it continues and says, They went down to the seaport of Seleucia, and then they sailed for the island of Cyprus. Now, why Cyprus? Why did that? This is their first missionary journey. We're going to be talking about this missionary journey for, uh, for a while here in the book of Acts, but why did they head out there? They could have gone anywhere, right? Barnabas is from Cyprus. So, you know, the text doesn't tell us why they went to Cyprus, but Barnabas is from there. So for them to go there, and at this point, Barnabas, it, it always still references Barnabas and Saul in that order. It's going to flip, I think in this chapter or the next one, it flips to where it always mentions Saul as Paul, but it also says Paul and Barnabas from now on. Paul and Barnabas, like Paul is the lead instead of Barnabas being the lead. So, but at this point, Barnabas is still the one. Barnabas, remember, he's the one that encouraged Paul and brought him along. And, you know, he's been the one leading from day one. He went and found Saul, right, and brought him to Antioch, and then they taught there for a year. He was still in Tarsus, and he was still being prepared by the Lord. So the fact that they go to Cyprus probably had something to do with Barnabas being from there. And then I started thinking about this pattern. As a teacher, I'm always looking for patterns in the word and things that are going on. You know, I just, that's something that I just geek out on, right? And I'm just looking for these things. So I, my first thought was, you know, well, Barnabas was from there. And then I started thinking of everything that I knew about Cyprus, even just from this book of Acts. And it said, I remember that people came from Cyprus to Antioch to share with the Gentiles. Back in Acts chapter 11, verse 20, it said, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, 
who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So back when the church started there in Antioch, there were people who came from Cyprus and shared with the Gentiles. And, and so much was happening in Antioch that that's when Barnabas came up from Jerusalem and said, i got to figure out what's going on up here. And he ended up staying and teaching and all that was going on. So to me, God's hand was on Cyprus because Barnabas was born there. But then when we first see him, he's in Jerusalem. But then he goes to uh, Antioch. People go from Cyprus to Antioch to even start the church there. There's something going on in Cyprus. So then I looked at it even further. When we learn about the persecution of the early church and how they get scattered out when Stephen is stoned, we, it tells us one of the places that people went to was Cyprus. And I'm sure they went all over the known world. I mean, when they were persecuted and scattered, they went everywhere, right? But it mentioned certain places. So the fact that it was recorded in the word of God that they went there, that was significant to me. So we know Cyprus shows up then. And then there was a, oh, and then today they choose to go there for their first time. So that's four times that we find uh, Cyprus mentioned. So God definitely has his hand on Cyprus and something is happening there. And another one, a fifth one's going to come up later, but that's just a, a sneak peek. Okay, so they're in Cyprus. That's where they go for their first missionary journey. So verse 5, we're still going through Acts chapter 13, verse 5. It says, there in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. Well, what we're going to learn about Paul is that that's his pattern. Over and over again, this is what he does. He goes to the Jewish synagogue first. It's to the Jew first and then to the Greek, right? He writes about that in uh, the book of Romans. He says it's to the Jew first. Romans 1.16, he says... And this is right, Romans chapter 1, it's right at the beginning of his book of Romans. You know, when he's still like establishing everything and laying out his, uh, his uh, book, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So Paul writes that later, much later on in the book of Romans. And it's his pattern. We're going to see it over and over again. As we follow his missionary journeys, we're going to see that he goes to the Jewish synagogue first and shares with the Jews and hopefully some of them uh, convert. Do you know that Christianity's always been Jewish? You know, Jesus was a Jew. It started with the Jews, right? So, and there's always been a remnant. There's always been a remnant of Jews that have carried on through. It's not like they're just now coming back. I mean, we're seeing a great harvest right now, people coming back to the Lord. And just a little side note, I mean, even during this virus, Israel's been locked down two different times. Just a week ago, they came out of another lockdown to where they couldn't go more than 1,000 meters from their house kind of thing, you know. And so man, there's been a lot of uh, Jews coming to the Lord because they're watching online and there's different ministries. G uh, Israel is so high tech, right? It's like another Silicon Valley over there. It's the startup nation. I mean, they are so high tech in Israel. You think they're in the desert and there's, I mean, if you've ever been there, you know, it's like super first world high tech. And a lot of people are watching these uh, videos and these testimonies um, and uh, coming to the Lord. And we're in the last days, and the Jewish people are coming. They're coming in. There's a harvest, and they're coming. So it's just exciting to me that that's happening here in these last days. But how did I get off? Oh, I got off on that because salvation, it started with the Jews. <laughs> and um, so, okay, I wrote a few things down here. Um, this is just, it, it is kind of a soapbox for me here. So I got to like, you know, I want to read what I wrote down yesterday. It says, I said, salvation started with the Jews. Christianity is Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. All the original apostles are Jewish. And we are grafted into the original olive tree, right? That's what it says in Romans 9 or 11. Yeah, Romans 11. We're grafted into that original olive tree. Christianity is not a separate religion, but the fulfillment of true Judaism. Messianic Judaism is a term we use to describe the type of Judaism that believes that Jesus is the Messiah. When we go to Israel, we teach on this. If you go on a trip with us, we take trips to Israel every other year. And if you go with us, we teach on this. We invite Messianic Jewish pastors that are there in the country to come and teach us. And, uh, so, and then we did a series in Digging Deep. If you want to go back and watch, we did a whole series um, called Why Christianity is Jewish. You could go back and watch that on Right Now Media. 
so I'll stop my rant about that. But it is so true that uh, Christianity is Jewish. We, that's our roots, and that we're still grafted in. It's not like we've left it. It's uh, we're grafted in. Okay, verse five, back in Acts chapter thirteen for today. To conclude verse 5, it says, John Mark went with them as their assistant. In your English translation, it may just say John, right? But uh, I think it's helpful when they put John Mark in there because that's, uh, that's who it was, was John Mark. And it's not John the Baptist, it's not John the Apostle, it's John Mark that was with them. Now, but who is John Mark? We've heard about him several times. Even in this book already, we've heard about him. He's Barnabas' cousin, that's right. We heard about him maybe first in the Garden of Gethsemane. On the night Jesus is arrested, and they come in the night, and he's in the garden praying, right? And he gets arrested. Uh, There's this young man mentioned in the book of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, there's this young man. He's not named, but we believe it's the author of the book. It's Mark himself, and that's why he doesn't name himself. But he's following Jesus on that night that he's arrested, and he's following the mob that had taken him away. And But it's like he... uh, he was awakened in the night that this was going on, and he went down and started following him, but he was only wearing a, uh, just a robe. That's it, like a linen robe. And the mob tried to snatch him, and they just got his, his robe, and he escapes naked, it says, in Mark 14, 51 and 52. So it says that, oh, I didn't write out all the verse, but it, it, you could read it in Mark 14, 51 and 52. It says, in that passage, a young man was roused from his sleep on the night that Jesus was arrested. He attempts to follow the Lord, and the mob who had Jesus in custody attempts to seize him. The young man escapes and flees into the night. The fact that this incident is only recorded in Mark's gospel, and the fact that the young man is anonymous has led some scholars to surmise that the fleeing young man is actually John Mark himself. And he puts himself in his, in his own story there in the gospel. But then we've heard of John Mark also because, remember when um, Peter gets rescued by the angel and rescued from prison and he goes out and all of a sudden he realizes this isn't a dream and he goes to John Mark's mom's house there in Jerusalem so we hear about John Mark there and then here in this story he travels with Barnabas and Saul later on John Mark travels with Barnabas only and not Saul and then he serves with Peter because many people think the reason Mark wrote the gospel was because he was kind of like Peter's um Ghostwriter, you might say, or whatever else, you know. Mark wrote down the Gospel of Mark, and we call it the Gospel of Mark, but he got his first eyewitness accounts from Peter, which is great because we have Matthew, who was an apostle, right? We have Mark, who got it straight from Peter. Then we have Luke, who was a historian, a doctor and historian, and he traveled all this and interviewed people. But then we have John, the one that was the closest to Jesus. So with our four Gospels, we have quite the uh, collection, right, of firsthand accounts but Mark gets his from Peter. That's the same guy right here that takes off with them, and he's their assistant on this. Later on in the book of Colossians, we learn that he's Barnabas' cousin, like we said. And then he serves again with Paul later on at the, toward the end. And he's mentioned in Philemon and 2 Timothy. Paul calls him a fellow worker and says to bring Mark with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. So... We, he's going to show up many times in, in, with Paul. Yes, yes, we're going to come to that. One more connection to Cyprus that I see is that uh, later on, Barnabas and John Mark, they lead a separate missionary journey from Paul, and they go to Cyprus again. So on the second missionary journey, Paul takes Silas and goes on his second missionary journey, but Barnabas and John Mark, they go back through that same missionary journey. See, the, the bad news we're going to learn about John Mark is that he deserts the mission. On this first mission right here, we're reading about how he goes with them, but on the first mission, he deserts them, and uh, it gets too difficult. And we really only have one convert mentioned in this passage today. It's the governor that gets saved there at the very end, which is awesome that the governor gets saved. But that's the only convert that's mentioned, and we believe it might have been a pretty tough missionary journey going across there. I don't know, because we have all this evangelism coming out of Cyprus. Maybe not. But for some reason, it got tough for John Mark, and he abandons the mission and leaves. And that's why Paul doesn't want to take him the second time. But the fact that Barnabas takes him again and goes back through Cyprus, and they retrace their steps, to me, that's a picture of restoration. 
that's the hope for us today, is even if we have deserted and come back to the Lord or walked away for a little while or it got too difficult for us and we kind of checked out for a season, Barnabas, you know, he's the son of encouragement. That's his name. And he takes John Mark on the second journey, and he takes him straight back through Cyprus. It's like a trip of restoration that he chooses him again and goes, Paul gave up on him. Paul takes Silas and goes a different way. And they, they, he doesn't repeat the journey. But I think it was important to Barnabas to go back through Cyprus with John Mark to restore him. And also, Barnabas wanted to go back and see those same people, encourage them again. It was like he was wanting to plow that same route, you know what I mean? And see what God would do this time uh, going through there, either encouraging the churches that were there or, uh, in, or seeing new people get saved, going back through that same area again. So I love that picture of, of restoration for us. Remember that when we get to the end of the study. Maybe that's your application is, is restoration. And maybe... You're John Mark, or maybe you're Barnabas, and you need to restore somebody and take somebody and not give up on somebody, right? It'd be easy for us in our human nature to give up on somebody who's left us or deserted or something like that. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, something else like that. But if God's calling you to do that, now I'm not saying Paul wasn't godly because Paul didn't take him, right? <laughs> But it was Barnabas' job, and maybe you're the one to take somebody uh, and uh, restore them. So that's going to be my application I'm going to come back to at the end is, do you have somebody that's like a John Mark in your life that you need to do that with? Okay, let's keep going in verse 6. It says, afterwards, they traveled from town to town across the entire island. It's a pretty big island as far as the islands go, if you look at it there on the map. Um... And they go across the entire island and they reach Paphos at the other end where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. This is an interesting guy. The word Bar, B-A-R there means son of. Like Barnabas is the son of encouragement. And this is Bar-Jesus. But Jesus was a common name. It was probably Yeshua or Joshua so he's the son of Joshua. Maybe his dad was just named Joshua. Um, or maybe he took on the name of Jesus because the word had been spreading out all over the land, right? That Jesus was doing these miracles and all of that. And uh, so maybe since he was a sorcerer and since he was trying to deceive people and trick people, maybe he was using Jesus' name to his advantage. Or maybe it was just a common name and that was his name and they called him the son of his dad, right? So, who knows? We learn in just another verse down here that his name was also um, Elimus, E-L-Y-M-A-S there in verse 8, however you say that, with my uh, Texas accent. I don't know how to pronounce that exactly like, uh, but um, <clears throat> this guy, verse 7, his name is Bar-Jesus. He's a Jewish sorcerer. He attaches himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who is an intelligent man. We know Sergius Paulus is the governor of that whole area. So he's a uh, political official. He, a governor is the title that you get if you're appointed by the Roman Senate. So he was appointed by the Senate. Not by the emperor, but by the Senate. But he was the leader of that uh, district, that area. So he's the governor. He's an intelligent man. For some reason, the word of God included that in there. I think that's uh, interesting. That's going to kind of come up in a minute. Um, the governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him for he wanted to hear the word of God. He was an intelligent man. He was curious, right? He wanted to know about this. I think intelligent people are, are curious, right? He's got this intellectual curiosity. He wants to hear about this. He's been hearing about Jesus. He's been hearing about these guys. They've been coming across the island. He's in charge of the whole thing, right? Things are happening. He wants to know and hear it for himself. He's open. That's good. He's a seeker, right? And uh, that's, that pays off for him. Verse 8, Belimus the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, he interferes and urges the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. The word picture I have is like he's, he's trying to hold his hands over the governor's ears and keep the governor from hearing. He's attached himself to him. So he's like stuck, stuck to him in trying to do this. One of our applications is, 
Do you have anybody like that in your life? Do you have anybody in your life who's trying to keep you from believing? We think just students have that, right? They have friends in school and high school or they fall into peer pressure or they get around the wrong crowd or they're young adults and they're in the party scene or something and they've got people holding their hands over their ears. And that's true. There's a lot of that going on. Maybe you have somebody in your life like that or maybe that's you. But we may forget that we may, uh, we may even have that in our life even, even at work. You may have a, a coworker who's been through a divorce, and they tell you it's okay to be divorced, you know, just get out of there. They're just speaking, they're speaking in your ear the whole time to get divorced, get divorced, get divorced, right? And uh, you're trying to believe God to restore your marriage, and they're speaking in your ear something else. That's like an uh, aliamus, right? That's somebody attached, trying to hold their hands over your ears. It's one thing to, it's one thing to, for yourself, resist the word of God and not receive it, it's one thing, I have freedom of choice, right? I can choose to not believe the word of God for myself. But to do that to somebody else and to keep them from hearing, that's a lot more serious that happens here. That's why this guy gets such a chastisement, right? What does Paul tell him? He has some harsh words for him, right? Okay, so... Let's pick up in verse 9. It says, Saul, also known as Paul. This is where his name changes. And it, we believe it's because it's not like you may think his name change has to do with like when, when Jesus changed Peter's name, it was for a specific purpose. And he said, you know, I'm going to build the church through you and all this kind of stuff. And things happen in the Bible where people's names were changed. But really his uh, Hebrew name is Saul. And his Greek name is Paul, and he just starts going by the Greek name because he's uh, doing this missionary journey to the Greeks. And so uh, it's just, and it, and it shows his Roman citizenship as well, which could be important if he's going into new towns for them to know that he's a Roman citizen. And he's about to speak to the Roman governor in this thing, so he becomes Paul. But what happens, this is a shift right here in verse 9, that through the rest of the book of Acts, he's called Paul. He's never called Saul again. It's the same guy, but he's always called Paul. And through the rest of the New Testament, he's Paul. So that happens right here. He, he's known as Paul. Verse 9 continues. It says, was filled with the Holy Spirit. That one phrase, was filled with the Holy Spirit. In our English translation, was filled, I don't know what yours says, but it sounds past tense to us, but it was not past tense in the Greek. It was present tense like when you study the original Greek, it was like instantly right then he's filled with the Spirit. It was a present action that happened upon him right then. So, you know, he, he received the Holy Spirit at salvation. Um, he prayed with other people to receive the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit came upon him right here. He's filled again. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit for a certain activity that God calls us to do, right? We want to be filled with the Spirit every day and walk in the Spirit and not quench the Spirit, right? But this is a moment, and he does, and I think it's important that we know that he's filled with the Spirit when he does this rebuke right here, because this is a pretty harsh rebuke right here. You see what it says? It says, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye, and he said, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud and enemy of all that is good. Will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? He has some harsh words for this guy. It's because he's keeping somebody else from hearing the word of God. And that's such a serious deal. And he's keeping the governor, and the governor can lead the whole island into the truth, right? If he, if he starts following the Lord, what a difference that would make. And so this boldness that comes upon him when he's filled with the Holy Spirit is pretty powerful. And he calls him the son of the devil. He, his name is Bar-Jesus, and that's kind of his uh, slogan or his, maybe that was his Instagram name or something. You know, I don't know. His, his name was Eliamus, you know, but he was also called Bar-Jesus, the son of Jesus. Maybe because he was trying to do magic and sorcery and he was trying to, wow people and he knew the name Jesus was associated with miracles so he called himself the son of Jesus but he calls him the son of the devil 
It's like he takes that word play and flips it on him. You know what I mean? He calls him, you're actually the son of the devil because you're keeping other people. And he keeps going. He says, you're full of every sort of deceit. And you know what the root word of deceit is in the Greek is the word bait. When the devil deceives us, he gives us bait, right? (laughs) He throws that bait out there and he hooks us with it and deceives us into thinking something that's not true. The bait of Satan is taking up an offense. We get offended We get our feelings hurt, happens in the church all the time, right? We throw our sucker in the dirt and get offended and walk away, you know. It's because we're deceived and that's what the devil does. That's what this guy was trying to do to the governor. But Paul says, you're full of every sort of deceit and fraud and enemy of all that is good. Will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? He really comes down on him hard. Oh, but now look what happens in verse verse 11. It's not just words. There's some action that follows this up, right? It says, watch now. That's interesting. The word watch, he's about to go blind and he says, watch. (laughs) Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Isn't that bold of Paul? He's full of the Holy Spirit and he speaks that out before it happens. He believed this was gonna happen and it happened. He wasn't doubting that this guy was going to go blind. I mean, he spoke this blindness over him. We think of uh, miracles only being positive and supernatural things happening only being positive. I mean, most of the time when we see that, we've even taught that in here how um, healing has a connection with evangelism. So many times when the apostles would go around healing people, they heal that uh, beggar by the gate going into the temple, right? They heal him. He gets up, jumps around, praising God everywhere. All the people see this is the beggar and he's gotten saved. The healing leads to evangelism and all these people getting saved. But this time, the miracle that happens here is he's struck blind and he speaks that to him and he goes blind. And it says instantly, verse 11, it says instantly mist and darkness came over the man's eyes and he began groping around, begging for someone to take him by his hand and lead him. I mean, I bet everybody backed away from this guy if he was struck blind right away, right? So when he's groping around for somebody to lead him, it's because nobody, they're not going to get near this guy, right? And he can't find anybody and he's he's blind and it, it, I mean, but Paul knew exactly what this felt like, right? When Paul was converted, he was struck blind and now he is, God's using him to strike somebody else blind. That's interesting to me that it's the same the same uh, action that happens here. But what we love about this is that it says, when the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. So, the governor's eyes are opened, right? (laughs) The sorcerer's eyes are blinded and the governor's eyes are open. He sees what's happened through this supernatural event. But I heard a good teaching on this this week that says it it was a good word of caution with this to not put your faith in the supernatural event. You know what I mean? We pray for supernatural events to happen. And this supernatural event that happened was important for this guy to get saved. But he didn't, the governor didn't just get saved because of the supernatural event. Because look at the last part of the verse. It says, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. So what really makes the difference for him is not the fact that this guy got struck blind. Because if you put your faith totally in the supernatural event, then a supernatural event could um, persuade you away from it also, right? If it took a supernatural event to convince you, then another supernatural event could, uh, another deceiver could come along and do some kind of magic or something or another lie could get in there and take you away. So it's not enough to just have this supernatural event happen. He also had to have the teaching about the Lord. He was an intelligent man. He wanted to hear about the word of God. God was working on him. God was drawing him there. And the Holy Spirit was on Paul. This supernatural event happened that confirmed it, I guess you could say. But really what kept him solid in this, and we hope he stayed with the Lord, was because he understood the teaching about the Lord. And Paul, I'm sure, was teaching him about the Lord, right? He didn't just, I'm sure, Paul was very wordy, right? And Paul was, uh, you know, 
He wrote a lot. He taught a lot. He would preach way into the night, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I'm sure that he had taught a lot to the uh, governor, and that's why also that he did. So we don't put our faith just in the uh, supernatural events. Now, it's not wrong to pray for a supernatural event to happen. I've done that. I've prayed for, if you're praying for somebody who's lost, and I hope you're praying for lost people in your life. Maybe that's your application today is to start praying for lost people again in your life, right? For coworkers or people you know or family member. Have you given up on that family? Don't give up on that family member that doesn't know the Lord yet. That cousin or that uncle or whoever it is, you know, don't give up on them. Keep praying for them to come to know the Lord. And you can pray for a supernatural event to come into their life. You know, I've prayed before, whatever it takes to get their attention. Their eternity is a lot more important than their present day happiness this week or whatever. You know what I mean? We prayed for one guy and he got arrested the next day, <laughs> taken to jail. <laughs> but we believed that was God working. We were excited that he went to jail for drunk driving. But we are like, get that guy off the roads for whatever and, and uh, arrest him spiritually. You know what I mean? And convert him. Maybe that's what it takes for him to... Uh, Come to faith in God. So pray, we pray for supernatural things. We need to be bold like that. Uh, we see this happening. I've even been to a seminar. I don't know. Years ago, I went to a seminar on power evangelism. It was like a missions class kind of thing. And it talks about in other countries sometimes when they have, I mean, this would be like a, uh, in another country in Africa or somewhere where they still have like witch doctors and things like that. And um, you can see power evangelism happen in those places where there's demonic activity. And God's coming into that area, and, it, and there's a power thing that happens. And um, I, I could tell you a couple of stories about that. My dad and I went to Africa on a mission trip like 25 years ago probably, and um, we saw some demonic activity and some power evangelism where people were converted through supernatural events. I mean, think about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. That was a supernatural event that happened, and, uh, and God's power was displayed through that. But then what happens right after Elijah there? He's discouraged, isn't he? He gets scared and runs off and hides after that big supernatural event happens. So we don't put our faith just in the supernatural event, right? It wasn't enough for Elijah either. But we put our, our faith in the teaching of the Lord and in our, you know, our relationship with the Lord. This this governor becomes a believer because he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. That's what did it. Really highlight uh, verse 12 there. Don't get too amazed with the blindness and the, you know, that kind of thing. I think the, the, the more important thing is that this guy comes to faith in Christ because uh, he's astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And that's what we, uh, we need to have. We don't just go in and do power evangelism and leave the people with nothing to uh, how to handle it, right? That would be wrong. If the house is, if you cast out the strong man and the house is left clean and vacant, then uh, the enemy can come man seven times more, right? That's in Luke. We, you can read about that. That's extra. Okay, let's, let's wrap this up and close down this with some application. Just to summarize, I've probably mentioned all three of these before. Let's just kind of summarize here at the end, and I'd encourage you to write down the application or write it in your phone and think about it this week or whatever it might be. The first one might be this for you. You can pick one. Um, the first one might be, who is a John Mark in your life? Who is someone that you can encourage or restore or give a second chance to or that God is, if God's calling you to do that? God called Barnabas to give restoration to John Mark, but he didn't call Paul to give. So if God's not calling you to it, don't take it up if it's not yours to do. Or if that's you, you're John Mark, maybe that's your hope today is that you're going, to, uh, you're going to follow again and not give up. The second application is there, is there an Eliamus? Is there a sorcerer in your life that has attached themselves to you and, quote, is trying to keep you from believing God? Close quote. Is there someone who's attached themselves like that? Or you've attached yourself to them? Because they've deceived you and kind of drawn you in. Maybe it's a girlfriend, boyfriend. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a friend that is always encouraging you to go the wrong way. Don't let that person be in your life. You need to. Paul dealt with this harshly when he was filled with the Holy Spirit and cut it, cut it out of that guy's life. 
uh, you need to see that. You need to have the miracle of sight happen for you that you see that you've got this person in your life, right? And uh, get them out of your life. If you need help with that, uh, get help from somebody else to uh, help you break free from that. Number three, do you have a word from God? They had a word from God to go on this trip. But also, remember the original word that Paul had. Remember when Paul was still blind and Ananias comes to him. Ananias had to be convinced to go to him, right? Because this guy was killing Christians and arresting them and dragging them out of their homes. So what God said to Ananias was he said, I'm quoting Acts 9, 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, go for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. Well, that's what he's doing on this first missionary trip, right? This is probably 17 years later, maybe 17 to 20 years later. And he is taking off on this missionary journey. And this word of the Lord is being fulfilled in his life. That gives me goosebumps to think about it. You know, the word of the Lord, this is exactly what is happening. He's chosen to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings. So when Paul was there in front of the governor, was he intimidated because he was the governor? We might be intimidated if we were in front of the governor or the president or the whoever like that, right? Because of their power and their influence and whatever else. He was bold and called this guy out and struck this guy blind. He taught, you know, he was ready because this was the word. He knew from the beginning that this was what he was going to be doing one day. And he's fulfilling it. And he hung on to that word. So maybe your application is, what is a word God has given you? Did he give you a word 17 years ago or three years ago? Or last week, did he give you a word that he is still accomplishing and wants to accomplish in your life? Maybe it's to go into the ministry. Maybe it's to write a book. Maybe it's who knows what. Maybe it's a certain type of ministry. I don't know what the word is for you. It will be unique. God loves you like that and wants to give you. Or if you don't have a word like that, go to our prophetic prayer ministry on Monday nights, right? And God may speak a word through that group that's trained to do that. Or get in a small group, get around some other believers, ask the Lord for a word. He wants to give us words because the prophetic word, remember 1 Corinthians 14, 3, it's for strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. It's only to build us up and help us. It's, it, it's not a, a prophetic word is not like striking somebody with blindness. That's, that's a rebuke, you know. <laughs> a prophetic word is something that we hang on to. Like, and Paul had this word. So he was bold to stand before the governor and share and even take on the sorcerer because he had a word from the Lord that had been confirmed. So do you have a word to hold on to? What is your application today? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We just open our hearts and minds to what you would want to speak into us right now. I pray that you would give us a word that you want to fulfill in our lives and that you would give us a calling, that you would give us your purpose that you would restore us and put us back on the path to follow you. Open our eyes to see. I pray for anyone that's watching this that has a deceiver in their life that's holding their ears shut. I pray that you would release them and they would receive your freedom. And instead, you would send a Barnabas into their life. You'd send a Paul into their life to show them the ways and to teach them the ways of the Lord. I pray that over each person. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here today.